just a couple more minutes before we get started on this rainy afternoon. So just sit tight for about two more minutes. I'm 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ellen Weinauer, and I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the Honors College here at the University of Maine. I'm delighted to welcome you all here to the 2022 John M. Resendez Visiting Scholar in Ethics Lecture. And I'm so excited to hear from our visiting scholar, Professor Vaishali Mamgayan, whose work in the fields of anti-racism, compassion, and community building is at once inspiring and challenging. And I know we will learn a great deal this afternoon. The Resendez Lecture is made possible by a generous gift made by Dennis Resendez in honor of his father, John. Passionate about justice, human dignity, and the needs of others, Dennis Resendez left his mark on the university through gifts that mirror his lifelong passions for honoring family, promoting ethical values and beliefs, supporting the performing arts, encouraging scholarship, and promoting global citizenship among young people. Dennis passed away in 2015, but his legacy is kept vital and alive by his wife, Bo, daughter, Cheryl, and grandsons, Gus and Brooke. None of the family members could join us today, but they are listening via live stream. And I would like to take a moment to thank them for their generosity and commitment to the University of Maine. Please join me in recognizing them. Thank you. As many of you know, the Resendez Lecture is part of the John M. Resendez Ethics Initiative, 
which also includes the Resendez Ethics Essay Competition. Open to all undergraduates at the University of Maine, this competition invites students to compose an original essay, so not repurposed work, on a topic identified by a faculty committee. This year's topic is the ethics of self-care. Here to say more about the competition and present prizes to our finalists and our winner is Professor Hao Hong. Professor Hong? Thank you, Ellen. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hao Hong. I am an assistant professor in philosophy and honors here at the University of Maine. And this year, together with Dr. Mimi Killinger, I co-chair the Resendus Ethics Committee. And it is my great honor here today to announce the finalist and the winner of this year's Resendus Ethics Essay Competition. And first of all, I would like to thank the Resendus family for their continuous and generous support for this competition. This competition provides a very valuable opportunity for our students to think and to write about the ethical issues around us. And more importantly, I think it's a reminder that the ethical perspective is very important in our decision-making because we are so used to think about things like how we should do this effectively, economically and productively, but we tend to spend less time to think about whether we should do it ethically and the right and the wrong question. So this competition is a nice reminder for us and an opportunity for us to think about things ethically. So thank you, the Resendus family for your generous support and for this reminder of the importance of ethics. And each submission this year, actually in every year, uh, went through a blind review process. So that's the reason we have a Resendus Ethics Committee. So I want to thank the committee members for your work, your time, and your support. And also I want to invite those members to the front and to um, give them a prize. <laughs> so uh, they are Dr. Mimi Killinger, Professor of Honors and a Resendus Preceptor of the Arts. And Dr. Joe Arrow, visiting professor in philosophy. And unfortunately, I don't think he's gonna, um, he's busy and he cannot make it today. And Dr. Cindy Erdley, professor of psychology and the chair of the Institutional Review Board for the Protection of Human Subjects. And Dr. Jenny Woodard, lecturer in honors and women gender studies. And also, I just want to say that the most important role in the committee actually is our coordinator is one of our honors associates, uh, Kitty Timms. She's coordinating with everything and try to reach out to everyone to find, you know, the most important thing to find a time to meet. Um, so thank you, Kitty, for your work. All right, now it's time um, to let you know the results of this year's competition. Uh, just a quick reminder, um, there, we are, there are two finalists and there's one winner. And the two finalists for this year's competition are Anna Lane for the essay, A Content Argument for Universal Healthcare. Anna is a senior double majoring in microbiology and biochemistry. Congratulations, Anna. And our next finalist, Iris May Fleming for the essay, The Effects of an Imposed Binary on Self-Care and a Proposed Alternative Model Using Care Ethics. And Iris is a... And correct me if I was wrong, and I believe Iris is a first year honor student majoring in journalism. All right, um, the winner um, of this year's Resendus Ethics Essay Competition goes to Elaine Thomas.
And the winning essay is titled, When We Cannot Care for Ourselves, Ethics, Interdependence, and the Moral Danger of the Self-Care Message. And Elaine is a junior honors student majoring in management and minoring in music. It's very nice to take a picture like this because I don't have to worry about you know how my smiling face looks like. <laughs> but I, I was smiling. <laughs> All right. Um, as part of the tradition, um, the winner gets a chance to read a short part of the winning essay. So I would like to invite Elaine to read that part from her essay. Thank you so much, Dr. Han. I think I need to scoot the stool over so I can <laughs> see over. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Practicing self-care seems to be touted as the answer for everything these days. Feelings of burnout, struggles with wellness, and general malaise are all attributed to lack of self-care. When we or the people around us express these vulnerabilities, our friends, family, counselors, and the media are quick to prescribe the full self-care package. A day to yourself, spending time on a hobby, making a healthy meal, going to the gym, watching a movie, getting more sleep, practicing yoga or meditation. We can all agree that personal well-being matters, as does care. How well-being is best achieved and who is responsible for ensuring personal well-being is the issue. Care should not and cannot be an individual endeavor, especially when our need to be cared for exceeds our individual capacity. To say that the way self-care is currently promoted is unethical sounds harsh and excessive. But when we stop to examine the people who are excluded and the potential solutions that are overlooked when we let self-care become the all-encompassing solution to well-being, the moral issue starts to look very pressing. Our answer to the ethical question of how well-being should ideally be received, really be achieved, really comes down to who we value. Do we value only those who can create their well-being? through individualism and self-sufficiency, in other words, through self-care, or do we also value those whose needs require more support? There will be seasons and situations for all of us in which self-care simply is not enough, or our capacity to, to care for ourselves is extremely limited. Care ethics is about beginning with the people in our networks when we think about how we want to live. The central assertion of this framework is that if we start with the personal connections we have with others, what constitutes right, productive, and considerate behavior comes more clearly into focus than if we try to base our ethical questions on what is good for us as individuals. We have an ethical obligation to shift the focus away from self-care and humbly acknowledge our dependencies on all sources and forms of care. Instead of framing our interdependence as a weakness or as a shameful reality that we must begrudgingly accept, we can make it our greatest asset. We can make personal well-being a community effort, each offering our unique strengths and resources to the people in our circles and being open to accepting other forms of support in return. Care ethics does not ask that we become uber virtuous and self-sacrificing, but that we realize the ways in which our societal glorification of self-sufficiency disrespects and devalues people, and that we reconnect to our most basic desire to meet the needs of the people closest to us, and that we be open to having our needs met by them too. This is the give and take of real human relationships and must be at the center of our ethical lives. It is more than okay that we cannot take care of ourselves by ourselves. And it is time to change our words, values, and actions to reflect that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine. 
And lastly, I just want to remind everyone that the winning essays uh, for the past two years and also Elaine's essay this year, they are online. Um, you can read them from the Honors College website. So take a look and I hope you can learn from them as much as our committee members learned from them. And also for all the students here, um, please take your opportunity to think about things ethically and possibly contribute a submission next year and you could be the winner. <laughs> all, right. all right, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, if we can just once more acknowledge the extraordinary work of these three students whose engagement in the ethical questions of our time honor the legacy left by Dennis Resendez. And I do want to shout out Mimi Killinger and Hao Hong for chairing this uh, committee. All the committee members, we appreciate you. Chairs of the committees, we appreciate you a lot. <laughs> so thank you so much. Now I would like to invite Professor, Je Professor Jenny Woodard to the stage to introduce our 2022 Visiting Scholar in Ethics. Professor Woodard. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have a few thank yous I'd like to send out before introducing our esteemed speaker today. Um, first, Elaine, thank you so much for that inspiring message that touches so many in this room, uh, including myself. And I think your words are quite powerful. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to take a moment uh, to send my own thank you to the Resendez family for their continued support of the Honors College and particularly this contest. Um, I was quite moved this year uh, with the number of submissions that we received, given that we all have so much on our plate and so many things that are of concern to us. And so the idea that students took this extra time to consider ethical concerns, I think was for much more than the prize money. They were very clearly um, engaged and focused and taught me a lot. So let's, I also echo the congratulations, very well de deserved to our three finalists. Um, so I'm going to ask you to clap again for our wonderful group here today. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's uh, Resendez lecturer, Dr. Vashali Mahamgayan. Uh, Dr. Vashali Mahamgayan is the Associate Professor of Economics and the Director of the Bertha C. Ball Center for Compassion at the University of Southern Maine. Mahamgayan received her PhD in Economics from the University of North Carolina at, Cap uh, at Chapel Hill. Her past economics research has focused on the contributions of immigrants and migrants and refugees in the Maine economy, including the role of migrant workers in Maine's blueberry industry. She teaches theoretical economics and classes like economics and happiness, the political economy of food, and practicing nature, deepening compassion. She is nationally known for her work in contemplative pedagogy, is on the board of the Center for Contemplative Mind and Society, and has been faculty at the summer sessions organized by uh, the Contemplative Mind and Society organization. In her role as director of the Center for Compassion and as a core faculty member of the Courage of Care Coalition, she facilitates anti-oppression workshops such as the upcoming Radical Communion series that explores how we can, with all our intersecting identities, build meaningful communities of practice together. She specializes in using somatic excuse me, somatic and immersive nature practices to undo internalized oppression and the colonization of contemplative practices. She now lives on an island in Maine where she can be found admiring seaweed, hiking, singing, and swimming in the beautiful Maine waters. I met Dr. Mamgayan in the summer of 2021 at the Summer Academy for Adult Learners and Teachers, also known as SALT at the University of Southern Maine. At this co uh, conference, Dr. Mamgayan led a workshop on practices of compassion in the classroom where she touched on functions of facilitating a safe space for students and faculty, particularly when so many of us are living through a time of upheaval and a definitive lack of security. I've long found practices of mindfulness and compassion to be beneficial in my own life and in my work. And in the research that I do is very much centered on notions of intersecting identities. So I was especially excited to hear what Dr. Mom Guyane would have to say. Her extensive knowledge and experience inspired much of what I put into practice this past academic year that I like to think of as kind of back to normal, but not quite over pandemic environment. 
Her work has been invaluable to my own pedagogical practice and the practice of so many others. So when the committee began to brainstorm possible lectures for this year's contest with the theme of the ethics of self-care, I immediately thought of Dr. Mom Gayan, and I am so pleased that she accepted our invitation. And it is now my honor to welcome to the stage, Dr. Fashali Mom Gayan. Thanks everyone, give me a moment please while <laughs> I unhook from things and hook other things up. Um, how are we doing on hearing me? Can we hear me? Fantastic. And at some point, if this doesn't work, please let me know. Okay. Wow, it's four o'clock, rainy May day. I want to check in that uh, the YouTube channel can see me even if I'm walking around. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so as a way of arriving in space together, how about we just feel our feet? Can we feel our feet together? Wonderful. And we don't have to do anything, just let's lightly tap one foot and then the other foot, and then again the first foot and then the other foot. And how about hands? Great, and I'm going to ask you, if all of these are invitations. If you don't feel like doing it, just be easy. Take your right hand, put it on your forehead a little bit like this. Take your left hand, put it on the nape of your neck. And just put gentle pressure on both these hands. And let's breathe together. Gentle in-breath. A nice, long, slow exhale. Let's do that another time. Gentle in breath, slight pressure, nice, long, slow exhale. Feeling those feet. And one last time. Gentle in breath, and nice, long, slow exhale. We're breathing out. Wonderful. Let's let those. Hands fall to our side. So that, my friends, the slightly long exhale is a nervous system hack. Anytime we're feeling a little bit like, and that was for me, not for you. <laughs> okay. So greetings, welcome. I want to just thank all of you for being here. I want to thank Jenny for thinking of me. I want to thank Ellen, for connecting and really just in the span of um, arranging for this, I feel like we've become comrades and we will be friends. And I want to thank the Resendez family. And um, as I was preparing for this, so you know how it is, you were asked for a title and I was, yes, yeah, self-care radical communion, walking each other home. And then as I started researching what Dennis Resendez had done in his life, I started realizing, wow, I'm deeply connected to the work he is so responsible for, hospice. My own journey, it's very, very um, intertwined with that work. And this book, Walking Each Other Home, is by people I consider my mentors and colleagues and uh, Ramdas and Mirabai Bush. And it is Conversations on Loving and Dying. So I just thought it was appropriate to just uh, bring that in. I want to take a moment and just acknowledge Elaine, Anna, and Iris. And I can sense this thing as one girl now. <laughs> Because reading your work was um, just reminded, it reminded me why, why we do this, why we are in education. It's because really wisdom, and I'm not even going to say knowledge, wisdom is, is so present. It's just, it's here, we have to be available to it. 
And when I read your work, I really felt, I felt um, schooled in the best possible way. So thank you, all of you. And you'll see, I'll refer to it. Yeah. Okay, so this is going to be the biggest challenge of the evening is to get me to walk this through. So Kelsey, are you online? Yeah, I'm over here. Okay, good. No, it's, it's definitely not doing it, Kelsey. I think I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you did this. I will fix this. Try it now. Okay. Oh, great. So I want to frame this work because um, I realize the word self-care, radical and certainly communion can have other meanings that we could get taken away with. And throughout this session, I'm going to invite you to do different practices. And these are invitations. If you feel like, oh, I'm not up for it today, please don't participate, no problem. This is a, a practice um, of identifying and actually mapping self. It's going to require paper pencil. When, when we come to this, I will tell you to pull out this. And I think I'm gonna go here so I can. And you'll see me dance with, back and forth between uh, the neuroscience of care and um, practice and the larger questions of who we are and how we're embedded in this world. Jenny mentioned intersectionality. And okay. come on, do it, do it. Wow. Oh, wow, wow. This last piece is important, so I'm going to joy. <laughs> I want us to not forget this. Because um, although it is absolutely true that the self care message has been co opted. Joy is a thing. Okay, so we'll come back to that. So a little bit about me. This is where I'm from, the high mountains in India. Right. So this is about 14,000 feet where my uh, grandparents lived, and those mountains in the back are 24,000 feet. Right. So I want you to take a moment and bring to mind some natural element in the place you were born, where you, the land of your first cry. Think about something, a tree, a lake, a pond, something. Right. So we're all going to take have a minute or a few seconds. Do we have such a thing? Yes? 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 Well, I was gonna, I was gonna mention the, the, the tree sparrow, which is like a, does that count? That's, a, that's the, the national bird of my home country. It was very common there. Wonderful, wonderful. Anybody else have a tree? How many people here like me were born in a place with trees. Yes, yes. How many people were born with mountains? All right. <laughs> Honor the mountains. How many people were born by water? Let's pause for a moment and think of the gifts of water. Yes. And we were all born on Earth. Yes, so it's right here. Okay. Beautiful. This is my grandmother, and that's me. <laughs> and you can see at my grandmother's feet, I don't know if you could see it, it's from an old photo. It's a walk. My grandmother was an eighth grade, had an eighth grade education, but she was one of the most brilliant people I knew. And she taught me a lot. Um, it was through the conduit of cooking, but really she knew the world. This is my brilliant father. He was in the army. And you can see you know how to have fun. Can you see that? <laughs> and this is my mother. She's a serious dude. And so I want you all to think, who 
who are who are your peeps and they don't have to be your familial people they can be someone who inspired you okay so everyone we're going to pause we're going to take a moment and we're going to bring to mind your people and feel your feet as you do this it helps to feel grounded because these people landed us right okay do we have someone yes one person everybody has one mentor you can bring to mind yeah somebody want to share a name if you feel comfortable doing that yes wonderful wonderful jacob great anybody else have a mentor someone else who helps ground ground you who helps both ground you and motivate you yes please uh yeah mine would be she's part of my family my mom and yeah my yeah fantastic did you say her name if you would feel uh, penny penny yeah. great wonderful welcome penny so i invite you all to just as you think of folks to bring them bring them into your into the space bring them into the field yeah okay Tell me this isn't happening. All right. This is what I would like folks to do. This is going to be quick. Yes? I'll give you two minutes. How's that? So this is not going to be, you're just going to stream of consciousness. And no pressure, remember, because these drawings don't have to be good. All you're doing is you are just connecting yourself. Any questions, clarifications? There will be no grade. And as you're drawing it, feel into these connections. Don't just be in your head, feel the connection. A tree you played in as a child. Right, maybe a house plant you love to hang with. A stuffed toy, anything, everything in your field that you feel connected with. That was very quick. Were people able to start working on this a little bit? Yes. Just reminding you of things. Or you just like it's four o'clock in the afternoon. Flash holidays if you are so bright. 
So I want to I want to actually highlight why I asked you to draw it. And part of this is the work that we're re realizing and uh, based in neuroscience, right? That drawing accesses different parts of us and knits together different parts of our experience. So that's why what we used when we were kids, did you all draw as kids? Yes. And how often do we draw now? Very little, right? So invitation, invitation to bring drawing and crayoning back into our lives. Okay. So this is this is from Merriam Webster. I'll let you all read it. And what do you think about this definition in light of the work we've already done, what Elaine was talking about? When you mapped yourself. Is this an adequate definition of self? You think it's okay? Shall we leave it? What do you think? No? Okay, how many folks think it's okay? Don't don't be shy. Okay, yeah. So some people say like this is good enough. Yeah, no problem. Someone there had um, their hand up. Yes, please. The self is also like your connection to other things. Yeah, I, exactly. I'm going to invite us, and this is a placeholder, folks. This is, a, is an extremely limited definition of self, particularly when we start understanding ourself, not just as a cognitive being, but as we talk about here, right, an affective being of being a sensing self, a perceiving self. So when I invited you to think of a place where you were born and there was a mountain there and there was a tree there, you sense yourself as someone who was born in the shadow of a mountain. Do you see that there is an interdependence there, the kind of interdependence that Elaine talked about? Right? So I know this seems a little odd, but hang with it, okay? So care, I actually did not know this word tries, draws from the same root as grief. Right? We're gonna come back to this, grief. Radical, going to the root. in communion, intimate fellowship. So I'm really veering us away from any um, religious meaning of the word, yeah? I want to tell you that as I was framing this work out, I realized, oh, I have had the great uh, privilege of sitting with a few people as they transition from this life to the next. And part of what happens when you're with someone as they're transitioning is uh, an ability to presence, right? To be with them, with what's arising for them. And out of that grief of losing this person comes a, a, an awareness that is markedly different from anything that we know in day-to-day -day life. And that allows for an intimacy that is not possible when we are thinking of what am I going to do tomorrow? What am I going to do tomorrow? Okay. So very uh, unknowingly, this work ties in deeply into the work of hospice. Okay. All right. I want to just bring us now back to the world of neuroscience. Um, the first part of our brain that developed was the brain stem, right? This is the brain stem right here. And it's our lizard brain. It cares only about one thing, safety. All it wants is safety, okay? Because you're gonna ask, if this is caring is so great, if presencing is so great, why aren't we in presence with each other? Why don't we care? And it's because our brain was initially designed just to keep us safe. So when we don't feel safe, we can't care for others. So here's our brain, the brainstem. It's literally a lizard. 
So this is the piece where if you're if we are trying to practice care, we have to be able to identify what state am I in? Am I activated? Is it safety I'm looking for? Okay. And in that case, what we want is safety. We want to be assured. So remember that thing I told us? Do this. This is this is a hack. This actually assures our nervous system, okay, you're going to be all right. Right? Because if our nervous system feels we're not going to be okay, it doesn't matter what's happening. Okay. The next part is the subcortex which developed. And that part wants accomplishment, it wants satisfaction. So you know the it gets a dopamine hit. The reason we are addicted to our devices is because pain, that's a dopamine hit, right? This mouse wants to do something all the time. It's accomplish, 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 accomplish. And so I want to pause because part of our sense of care start can be uh, taken away and saying, oh, care means just safety. Yes, safety and feed the mouse. How does care show up here? A lot of times in our society when we're showing care to someone, I want to do something. I want to do something for someone. And that's fine. And we have to really check in with ourselves and say, oh, what part of this is actually feeding my mouse? Is the dopamine hit? I'm doing this for me not because it's actually helpful to the other person. Yeah? And then this is the prefrontal cortex, the last part of our brain. It's the primate brain that developed. And what the primate brain wants is connection. Okay? So if we're going to define care, we have to be first acknowledge where, where am I in this? What am I looking for? And how can I offer care? What is this other person looking for? If they're looking for safety, and I'm offering them connection, that's not, that's a miss. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is a piece that I love. And this comes from Dr. Rick Hansen, um, from his book, Hardwiring Happiness. He's at UC Berkeley Center for um, the Greater Good Sciences Center. And, you know, he explains how our brain evolved was Okay, so you know we evolved in small groups. Is this all old hack for you? And you know, mostly we were kind of hanging out together. We were having a good time or kind of hungry, but we were hanging out. And then suddenly, once in a way, a saber-toothed tiger jumps out from the bushes. And what do we do? We fight, flight, freeze. Something, right? We react. And then after that has gone, then we come back to group. And when we come back to group, we're in group, we feel sick. So our nervous system starts relaxing again. Okay. That was how our nervous system evolved. Now let's look at our current uh, stressors. Has anybody here recently had a saber to a tiger or jump out at you? <laughs> Has somebody had um, somebody cut you off while you're driving? Yes, yes. So what happens is our nervous system takes something that was intentioned for the kind of danger that a tiger represents, right? And as soon as someone cuts us off in traffic, danger, 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 it privileges negative information. Our brain is wired to privilege negative information. So what that means is, and because, those of our ancestors who were kind of just hanging out, saw a tiger, didn't react, well, they're not here. Their gene pool is not of us, right? So our brain has this ability to let the good stuff just slip up. Think about a day where you had 80% of the day was great, and you had one bad thing happen, and you're thinking about a bad thing, you're thinking about a bad thing. Not our fault. Brain was designed to do that. Um, am I doing something wrong, Joe? Should I be breathing less? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's not bad. Um, so, and it's Velcro for the bad. Anything bad that happens, the brain catches onto it. And this is a very startling and sad ratio, y'all. 
It's five to one. Five positive things have to happen in our lives and for us to in, just really acknowledge them before that one negative thing works up our brain. Okay, This has real ramifications for how we are with ourselves and with each other. Right? Because every stressor is hitting us and we don't know how to come back. So, and this is a nod to our finalists here. If, when I'm talking to you about this, it might just seem like, oh gosh, that here is Vaishali telling us individualism, right? Here, write yourself, breathe, long, long exhale. And I'm not saying that. Actually, I am saying that because <laughs> I'm saying each of us, each of us, look at your drawing you drew. Each of us is connected to a web of people. We are embedded in a matrix, yes, of interdependence, as Elaine said. And, and there are two things that we realize when we start doing this work is, oh, because I am embedded, I actually matter. How I take care of myself matters because my life and my heart and my aspirations affect everyone I'm connected with. I matter not to the exclusion of everybody else, but in service with everybody else. Yeah, this is a very different thing. And part of our problem is in modern society, we have been uh, taught to be alienated from this sense of self. In many religions, right, they'll say, oh, you're being selfish. And this is another reason I want to just sort of share some of the most recent um, work here. Repeated exposure to trauma can be transmitted intergenerationally. What that means is that if we don't know how to heal personally and in relation to each other, this is going to be transmitted to the next generation. And this is in the world of epigenetics. Check that out. How many of us are on news media all the time? And we're actually finding that the more we listen to negative news without having a capacity. So this is uh, the result from an experiment where we had multiple groups um, who were given, would you rather I use that too? Turn that off. You hear me now? All right. Oh. Um, so what we find is that when people are um, given negative news and not given anything to resource themselves with, compared to control groups where they are given practices of self-care and compassion, these folks become much more insensitive. Right. So just want to um, tag that as well. Look at that. People with lower levels of self-kindness perceive themselves in a more negative way. They perceive themselves, we perceive ourselves more negatively and then the world reflects this back to us. This is also true. And I want to run through these, but I want to tell you the two folks that are really pioneers in this field are Dr. Christian Neff and Dr. Barbara Fredrickson. Uh, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson is at UNC Chapel Hill and Christian Neff is UT Austin. So I want to show you this uh, picture of a mountain because when we start talking about care, and uh, compassion, one of the things that becomes very striking is this idea of being in community. So this mountain is reminds me of an experiment done by Dr. Jim Cohen down the University of Virginia. And so he had two people who were connected, friends, couples, uh, come in and see a picture of a mountain. And they are holding heavy backpacks and they're holding hands. 
And then he asked them to go in separate rooms, take out the backpacks, and write down how high they thought the mountain was and how heavy the backpack was. Great. Then he has people who are single come in, look at the mountain, have the backpack on their backs, and then they have to write how high the mountain was and how heavy the backpack was. You know what I'm going to tell you. People who were holding hands felt the mountain was not very steep and the backpack was not as heavy as it was. People who were doing this alone felt it was, the mountain was higher and the backpack was heavier, right? This is something we've all known. Anybody who's done anything in community, we know this, right? So this question about how can we actually be in community with others? This is a question which is really alive. And I wanna just say that in this historical moment to say, well, we're all a human race, we should just get along. Can you see how that perhaps is not it's, it's, not, it's not the best answer. The why? Because each of us has different, what is called sociocultural location and intersectionality. What does intersectionality mean? It means, so for instance, I am a, uh, an immigrant to the United States. Uh, I am dark skinned. Uh, I am a minority in terms of religion. I have um, high status in terms of education, right? So can you see these are all different parts of my identity and they intersect in a particular way, right? So the reason we can't just say, why can't we all just get along is that actually you may not know my experience and I may not know yours. And we don't want to make a blanket assertion of uh, let's just get along unless we are prepared to do the work and acknowledge that people occupy different locations. Make sense? Okay. And this is just some of the ways, some of the, um, I noticed in the Honors College, uh, right outside your office, Alan, there was a sign that said, no matter what your age, your orientation, you're very welcome here. And I was laughing because it is, this is a, a chart. Uh, you can see, in these ranks, and these are not the only ranks, you can have agent status or target status, right? We can have high status, which means if in our society in the United States, if you're between 18 and 64, you have more agency than if you're a young person, okay? I'm gonna run through this because this you know, but And this is a great order, Lord, yeah? Without community, there is no liberation, but community must not mean a shedding of our differences, nor the pathetic pretense that these differences do not exist. And this is a difficult work. This is very difficult work. So I'm going to actually pause, and um, Elaine, you mentioned the, the, the day to yourself. The meditation, the yoga, the spa, the uh, engage in hobby. Yeah. And I want to give it a different turn. And I want to say, actually, to do this work, we're going to need to have an inner life. Okay. So now I want to hear from you. Um, who here skips stones? Okay. <laughs> And would someone be willing to share what that feels like? Yes, please. When it's successful, it feels elating and like you're a kid again. And when it's not successful, it's not that frustrating. It's not that frustrating. Yeah. Wonderful. And and when you're when it's successful, it feels elating and like you're a kid again. And how does that feel? Tell me what what is the feeling tone? What is happening in your body when it's working? Yes. Um, a buzzing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, fantastic. Anybody else skipping stones? Success in skipping, yes, first in the back. Um, I agree. I think when 
you're successful or even when you're unsuccessful, you get to jump. It feels equally cathartic in a way. Yeah. I feel whether I'm successful or not, I feel nostalgic almost. It reminds me of childhood. Mm. Yeah, and what does what does childhood remind you of? What is that? What is the nostalgia for? So it, it, it reminds me of the things that I identify with the most, the people in my life, the locations that I remember the most. Yeah. That makes me feel very happy and like I'm, I'm where I belong. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm where I belong. Very nice. Anybody else want to share skipping stones? The feeling successful or not successful, <laughs> Jenny? Are you are you a skipper of stones? Oh yeah, for sure. And tell us. <laughs> um, I absolutely agree with that. That kid like sense and the outcome really doesn't matter to me at all. I just as soon as I skip it, I'm almost not even looking to see if it skips or not because I'm I'm ready to look for the next flat <laughs> rock that's going to let me have that same sensation again so that the outcome really doesn't matter it's just the yeah it's just the the action and i totally agree with the buzzing good job yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm going to just sort of uplift what you all have said yeah to do the work that is being asked of us right now we cannot actually just engage in action we have to have a life which allows for pauses Skipping stones is a pause. And what's also happening uh, from a neuroscientific perspective is the power of the natural world to soothe us. Right? How many people here like to watch water? And what happens when you're watching water? Absolutely nothing. That's the best part. <laughs> exactly. But you like it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Water. How does it feel? Yeah, a person in the back. No. What is watching water or being in water? What does it evoke? Yeah. I feel very small and off water. That's what I like. Yeah. But you're there. You feel small and you're there, right? And you're there. So I'm going to really uplift the idea that actually it does help. It helps to reorient us to take time and move away from devices. The natural world where we live is so extraordinary. The research is abundantly clear right whether you're with a tree even contemplating being out can help you and what you said about feeling small it actually does because we co-evolved with nature our nervous system is designed to be soothed by nature right and so it's really important to get a sense of perspective so even in this moment, folks, if you want, take a moment, just look out of that window, just look straight out the window, look at a tree. Yeah. Wonderful. And then I want you to just follow the walls. Don't look at any of the fixtures. In this room, come back, follow the walls. Look at one wall, look at the other. Very nice, we're looking around the walls. And then I want you to look at the floor. Yeah. Remember we tapped our feet? Yes. And then look at the ceiling. And then just for a moment, have that ceiling look down at you. Okay. That practice, if you do it, and what is basically tuning our nervous system to kind of know one, their safety, right? We have these walls, safety. <laughs> And it's rewiring our neural networks to know that there's continuity, that we are we may be small and we are a part of something else. So
So part of, I want to uplift what all the finalists here said, and when we are talking about an ethics of care, to reorient that not in an intellectual cognitive sense of ethics, but ethics as a lived experience of interdependence. Yeah, and that can't happen without being rested if we are in fight, flight, or freeze mode, right? So I want to say it's important to have these things. So remember when I said bring one person a mentor to you, right? A coach, a teacher. This is a practice. So Rick Hansen, whose work I was just sharing with you, because we have such a predilection for negativity, we want to start building a library of moments where we can just call upon when something good happened to us. Yeah? So when can, can folks do this now? When something good happened to us? It could be a sunset. It could be that water you're watching. Right? Just bring it to mind, inhabit that moment, experience it fully, right? And when you do that, let's do that now. And we're going to just soak in that moment. So if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, go for it. And bring to mind, it can be your dog licking your face. <laughs> Anything where you felt seen, loved, recognized, or you felt moved by beauty, just moved by connection, your grandparent giving you a hug. Okay, bring it to mind, soak it in. And the magic number is 13 seconds. So breathe in, breathe out, and be wet. So I'm inviting you to start cultivating that. Yes? Could people do that? Was that accessible? And the thing about neural networks is um, neurons that fire together, wire together. So if we start building uh, an availability for ourselves to access these moments, the next time our mind goes there real fast. So we're having a bad time. We're actually trying to help someone. I'm going to tell you something that, um, you know, is a very alive experience. Somebody says something disrespectful to someone else in front of you. And you have no idea how to respond because you yourself are in fight flight mode, right? It's really important to not rush in, to have a practice where you're grounding, where you're like, okay, I need help, I need help. It's like reinforcements, reinforcing yourself to be present. And sometimes this other friend of yours or this person to whom this is happening may just need presence. Yeah? So you're practicing being present to yourself and so you can be present to others. Okay? Ah, this is from Rezma Menekam, a trauma therapist who has this beautiful book out called uh, My Grandmother's Hands, right? A healing from racialized trauma. And what he says is settled bodies, settled bodies. And what that means is if you are settled in your nervous system, because we are primates, we are reading off each other. And all of this is to not get away from the work of systems change. Absolutely. All that, remember I showed you all those locations, age? It is not cool that we live in a system where children are subject to abuse, where we don't have respect for elders, where they don't have enough resources. It's not cool. We have to change those systems. It's not cool that people are discriminated on the basis of no amount of breathing is going to change that. The reason I'm inviting you to develop a practice of self-care is to engage the work, to lean into systems change. Yeah, not instead of. And this, okay, so here you are. This is a practice you'll be able to invite you to do. Pens and papers, if it feels like we may be running out of time, so. Just let's think about these. Uh, how about pick one of these prompts? Pick one of these prompts, I give you two minutes. 
it breaks my heart and just finish the sentence. Finish the sentence anyway. It breaks my heart. You're finishing the sentence. Or you can pick, it sustains me and you're finishing the sentence. Okay. And, or you can pick, I wish I knew. Ideally, you would have time to do all these. But pick one and free write, finish the sentence. And just keep using that, keep writing that. And if you have more time, then you can, you can hit all three. But go to the one that attracts you, finish that sentence. Hey, we have it. Were you able to write? Were you able to complete those sentences? I know it's a lot to ask, like just cold. Yes? Anybody want to share one of these, whatever feels comfortable? It breaks my heart. Someone who feels comfortable sharing what breaks your heart. Okay, let's just see how many people have broken hearts. Yeah, 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 yeah. How many people feel sustained? Yeah, and folks with broken hearts, um, where does it hurt? Where does it hit? Where does it sit with you? The broken heartedness. Yeah, right? You can feel it. It literally feels like a broken heart. And the feeling of feeling sustained, where is that coming from? Where do you feel that? I have support, I have support. As I say this, yeah, shoulders, exactly, right? You can feel it in your shoulders. I wish I knew, where is that? Is there someone who wishes they knew something that, how many people here feel wish they knew something? Okay, wonderful. And where is that living in you? It's going to flow to it, right? There's a flow aspect to I wish I knew. So I want to just sort of say these are really things to lean into because this, these three queries, who am I offering care to? Because breaking your heart only breaks when you're connected to someone, right? It breaks my heart. And then figuring out what are, my, what are my resources? Who else is here? What else is here? What sustains me? What can I call forth? And in this, we include absolutely systems work. And then I wish I knew. This is why we are all here. We are here in learning spaces and really the call for us is to skill up. Yeah, the fact that we are these living, feeling beings, and there's so much, there's so much to love, live, and feel into. Yeah. Ah, oh, sorry, we didn't get time to do that. <laughs> Yeah, 
So yeah, our struggles are different, but we're really being called to be in community with each other, to express solidarity with each other. And here I want to emphasize, and you see that um, on the right, that is Reverend Trisha Hersey's NAP ministry. Okay, because particularly for women, particularly for black and brown women, the notion of rest was not allowed, right? So that's why I really acknowledging we have the right to rest. We have the right to rest. And we have the right to be joyful. Okay? Because it's already here. How many people here like to sing in the shower? <laughs> How many people here like to move on occasion? Yes, there you go, right? Dance. Movement dance, not always the same, fantastic. Cook, how many people do you like to cook? Oh, look, this is how our culture continues, right? So I want to really acknowledge that care extends, it's already here, we have known how to care, we have known how to love, we know how to move, to sing, to dance, okay? And I'm gonna pause there and I will take any questions if you have them. This, of course, is the great Adrian Marie Brown, author of a wonderful books, including Emergent Strategy and the book, Pleasure Activism, which um, they are basically telling us that, hey, this work of walking each other home does not have to be all, um, all work, right? We're doing it, there's a joy in it, okay. about all of you but i'm gonna go home and draw a lot and sing on my 30 minute drive home you're welcome to join me. um okay so for the remainder of our time um we would like to see if there are any questions for our um speaker today if you have questions you can raise your hand and i'll come to you and offer you the microphone to speak it yourself or if you feel uncomfortable speaking aloud you can whisper it to me and i'm happy to repeat it for you um, so is there anyone who has a question for Dr. Um, Vashali, yes. Does anybody have any questions for Vashali? Yes, please. Um, I'm sorry, but like, I want to write the name correctly. Sure. Yeah, Vashali, we, a, so we as in victory, my father was in the army, and so we were from victory. A as in Alpha, I as in India, S as in Sam, H as in Happy, A as in Alpha, L as in Love, I as in Love. Thank <laughs> Any other questions? This is about the spelling of Vashali's name, an excellent question that we should all be mindful of. Uh, are there any other questions for Vashali? Can we direct? A yeah. Yes. Uh, what do you wish? What do you wish you did? I'm going to repeat questions just because there are people who are watching from a live stream, just to make sure that everyone's able to hear that. So, the question is for Vishali: What do you wish that you knew? Oh, what's your name? Uh, Martin. 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 I, I, I wish I knew how to. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I wish I knew how um, to trust trust this uh, heart and connection that I know I have to other beings, and I wish I knew skills to be able to relate well to others who are who have different um, positionality. Yeah, and also I wish I knew how we could love our planet back into health. So. Anything for that, Martin? Would you share? What do you wish you knew? Uh, oh God, um, my all my three prompts were kind of. I wrote it. It breaks my heart when York Dining Hall is out of Korean barbecue beef. <laughs> and I wrote it. It sustains me when York has Korean barbecue beef. <laughs> and I wish I knew when they had it next. <laughs> And I, I, I admire that. I admire that clarity. 
And I really want to so acknowledge folks. We have fun in our lives. Who would have thought that at age 20, 21, we would be looking back nostalgically to our childhood? Are you all, are you all feeling the sadness of that? Yes? So people, this is a good life. Caring for barbecue beef, fantastic. Great. And when you do have that Korean barbecue beef, and I say this in all sincerity, eat it with pure enjoyment and build into it your neural networks. The idea I have enough. Because I'll tell you as an economist, the first thing we tell people in economics classes is, oh, there's scarcity. Actually, the world doesn't have scarcity, right? A sense, because we have lost touch with our sense of what suits us, what comforts us, what connects us, we're going after more and more. But even in the very individualistic sense of retraining ourselves to enjoy Korean barbecue, really, we would not eat so much if we actually paused and, and enjoyed it thoroughly. Yeah? So with great appreciation. Anybody else? <laughs> and really, no question, really fantastic piece. Um, my question is, so why do you think that we use so much trauma exposure in the media if it affects us as a society so negatively? So the question is, and a powerful one, I can't wait to hear this answer. Why is there such trauma exposure in the news media when we know that it affects us so negatively? It's a great question. And for folks who might be in journalism, I think one of you is in journal. Yes, Iris. So apparently in newsrooms, the mantra is if it bleeds, it leads. Because, and not because newspaper editors or um, media moguls are intrinsically evil people, but because it's understood that our brain has such the capacity for negativity. We thrive operating that just because our brain, that's how we evolved. It was like, I want to be safe, so I want to know what all is happening, not realizing it's going to have this damaging effect on us. Yeah? Thank you for that question. And I would say um, it is really important to be aware of our data consumption, of our news consumption, and to do it in a mindful way and having a feed that's constantly in the back um, actually affects us subliminally. So it uh, ties into our sense of feeling unsafe and that's what keeps us from caring or extending care for others. So very much limit, um, limit, your, limit bad news, yeah? And at the same time, when we hear something wonderful happen, like, for instance, I will just say, when I was reading uh, Dennis Resendez's life, I just, I had to pause and say, wow, like, wow. Like, really absorbing. I don't have to do everything he did. I can just rejoice in the fact that there are people who do this. Right? And the secret is, my neural networks actually don't know the difference. If I truly learn to rejoice, I get that sense of like, wow. So for those of you science fiction fans who wonder if we are uh, plugged in, into some kind of machine and if this word is real, um, I want to tell you that the cutting edge neuroscience is basically saying our brain hallucinates reality. Right? And that reality is fed by whatever our exposure is. So <laughs> there's a question right here. Oh, sorry, they came up with it. Is it the student question first? Oh, then? I'm so sorry. Yeah, if there's a student who has a question first, you guys. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, good, good, good. Thank you for that, Mimi. That's quite thoughtful. What's your question? Um, my question is related to what you just talked about um, as this generation that is so connected to our devices, um, do you have any strategies for how to limit that or any resources that we could use? Because it's a, it's a problem that I don't think any of us really know how to address. Okay, so full disclaimer, I don't have a single social media account. So I wouldn't be able to tell you what to do to filter things out. 
Um, I do know that there are, um, because what you're describing is such a persistent thing, there are apps out there to limit stuff. I can get back to you because I do have friends who do that and they will tell me I'm feeling so uh, virtuous. I'm only doing TikTok one hour a day. <laughs> oh my God. So, <laughs> so I will get back to you. I know this is an issue. Thank you. And having an awareness around it. By the way, my uh, colleague from uh, University of Washington, David Levy, would routinely have people do this. And I'm going to invite you. If you do you believe that? Um, your devices kind of stress you out? Yes, yes. Okay, so if we have that awareness, that's the first step. Um, what to do about that? That's, that varies. Okay. We have roughly five minutes left. Is there anyone who has a question for Vishali? Was it fun? Or was it just like, oh my God, <laughs> So the question is, was it fun or dot dot dot? Yes. Thank you so much. I found many of your, uh, well, just your wisdom so fascinating. And I was particularly taken by this notion that we're embedded in a matrix of, of others and a, a community. And, and this, I find it haunting the idea that repeated trauma can be transmitted intergenerationally. Um, but I also wonder, can repeated joy, isn't the neuroscience saying that repeated joy can also be transmitted intergenerationally? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, Mimi, right? Mimi's question was, can, uh, just like inter trauma can be transmitted intergenerationally, does joy work that way as well? Yes, yes. And the idea is that, you know, we are infinitely mutable beings in ways that we haven't even figured out. And a very, even if we don't go into the genetics of it, what we're really finding from the neural mapping that folks are doing is when I'm talking with you, and you know those um, nerd caps, right, with electro electrodes, and you can map people's brains, and now you can get them for 250 bucks. So if you all really want to do this, go for it. Um, <laughs> So if Mimi and I are talking and we are in sync, the same part of our brain starts lighting up. It's the reward center, right? We are, we are resonating, we are in, in sync. We, our frequency is the same. So in a very real way, what we're doing is re, um, sort of reconfiguring each other's nervous systems, right? And so really it becomes very important to celebrate joy and to be with. And that itself helps reduce stress because the, uh, the, gener the intergenerational transmission happens primarily through the stress hormone. So when we're less stressed, what we're getting is a different, um, a different being that's born from each other, right? In, in, in real life and biologically in, in current time. Wonderful. Was there another question? Oh, right here. Just to clarify, this concept of uh, intergenerational transmission, you, you're referring to the uh, you're referring to people's expe uh, experiences influencing their parenting style, right? No, actually, thank you for clarifying that. Oh, so, so it is it is a, a biological. It's a biological, and I I, I would love to uh, talk. Um, so this is based on the work of Dr. Rachel Yehuda, who worked with children of Holocaust survivors. And what she found was that children of Holocaust survivors had shorter telomeres. So telomeres are like the aglet on the end of our shoe. So I didn't know this word, people, do you know aglet? It's like that thing. Okay, so apparently the end of our DNA has this thing, which is like the aglet, and it's a telomere. And the length of that determines how many times your cell is going to replicate. And that means that you grow older slowly when that cell is able to replicate faster, right? So what she found was that in children of Holocaust survivors, the telomeres were very shortened. 
And she was the first person who found this. And since then, that study has been replicated. So the book I was re uh, referencing, Raise My Mana Comes to My Grandmother's Hands, has a bunch of stuff like this around um, this work. And the person I recommend is Dr. Elise Apple, who has done a whole book on telomeres. Right? She's out of UC San Francisco. So thank you very much for clarifying that. And I saw someone here had, can, yes. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to ask about the cycle that we get our, that we find ourselves in when we are ex witnessing joy, experiencing it, recognizing it, we continue to feel joy and that's wonderful. But also when we get, when we are experiencing trauma, when we're thinking about the sad things, we get stuck in that cycle. How do we break out of it? And I know it's a huge question and there's no really good answer, um, but so far as you can get. <laughs> okay, so how do we break out, especially when we are actually in it? Right when we are really in the stress and the trauma and the suffering, how do we break out of it? I want to refer you to the work of Elaine Thomas <laughs> <laughs> and the importance of networks. It's really important to recognize and have networks, right? So I want to just say these practice these are practices. The reason we're calling them is practice. Even it's it's not too early nor too late to start building a practice of checking in with each other in a real way. I'm here, what do you need, right? So this is not some highfalutin idea of when somebody needs me, I'll be there. Map, map your ecology. Who are, who, who are your people? Whose people are you? And start building in a sense of um, shared accountability to each other. Yeah. So I want to say, I know we're on time. Um, this is work. This takes real work. And because also what comes up, and I will tell you this from the world of um, being in social movements, what comes up is our own stuff. Right? And that's why we need to actually really work with our own stuff. Because also what we are transmitting to another is what we have not metabolized. And this is a whole other, and, and the, the journey is beautiful. It can be painful, but it's also, we're shedding off things where sometimes we're just fearful because we don't know, right? So was it Martin? Yeah, Martin, I wish I had known when I was younger that I, you know, like fear is a thing, but it's also okay, right? So I would say that is, we have to take a step, take a step forward, yeah? And cultivate joy, because remember, it's the five to one ratio. And I want to also emphasize what again Elaine said, everybody doesn't have the possibility of having a day off. So looking around and saying who in our system does not have the privilege of taking a day off, of going for a walk, of being in nature, right? So having that acknowledgement and, and having the aspiration. So I would like having the aspirations, I wanted to sort of say that in my tradition, every time we start a practice or we start a session, we start with an intention. So we started with an intention. What does care look like? What does radical communion look like? We do the practice. So you all did this mapping practice and we always end with a dedication. And the dedication is the takeaway. And the takeaway is we can do this individually for each other. And the the story around dedication is, if you see a drop of water on a big rock, the sun will beat it down, right? And evaporate it. But if you take that drop of water, the work we accomplished here today is like a drop of water. We kind of enlivened our minds with something. And we take that and we say, we are dedicating this for the benefit of all being sentient, non-sentient, slow sentient, right? Trees are slow sentient. 
That is like taking that drop of water, harvesting it and putting it in a lake. And now that drop of water is for the benefit of all beings. So having a long view, having a long view is really important. Our problems are not going to go away today or tomorrow, but really knowing, wow, this is what I'm doing is connected. It's connected. Yeah. Okay, now I'm totally over. <laughs> <laughs> I just um, don't, don't no, there's something for you. Um, I feel very grateful. I think we all feel grateful uh, for your presence, your teaching. Um, I feel that we needed to hear what you were here to say to us today. So thank you so much for being here. Everyone, can you please express our gratitude? Say a quick word about the nature practice because some may think you're not going to be doing it, but we're going to be doing it. <laughs> uh, so, tomorrow morning, 8 30, at the at Colvin, where by the way, I would be up for beef for breakfast if they had it. Um, we are going to do a nature practice, and which is just going to be some more of what we did today, which is just like be in nature with nature, presencing ourselves. Yeah, if you feel like joining us, bring a raincoat, be comfortable. I will ask you to touch a tree, to walk on earth, <laughs> right? So be comfortable with that. I don't think the bugs are out yet. Yeah, okay, great. I look forward to seeing you all. I think rain or snow, whatever, we're just doing it. Um, yeah, I didn't take this and breakfast after. I didn't take the snow tires off my car because I was like, I'm going up to Orono. <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> So see you tomorrow. We do have a, um, a couple of tokens of appreciation. So um, the University of Maine, as you may know, is famous for its steins. And the Honors College has a stein tradition. This is a stein made by, we have potters make them every year. This indicates the year of the program's founding, 1935. So that's for you. And then we have a framed copy of your poster to take with you. Oh my so, God, I love stein. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your attention again to the Resendez family. Thank you for uh, inviting us in to think about our ethical lives and, and um, put your feet down on the ground and breathe. Thank you.